Receive our worship. Receive the adoration. In Jesus' name we have worshiped. I didn't hear that. Amen. If you are glad to be in the church today, shout the loudest Amen. Glory to God. Turn to somebody and tell him what God is doing in your life is more powerful than what the devil is doing against you. Turn to another person, tell him what God is doing in your life is more powerful than what the devil is doing against you. Now say to yourself, what God is doing in my life is more powerful than what the devil is doing against me. Amen. Put your hands together for the Lord. Welcome to today's service and those of you online and everyone on site. Congratulations to those of you who are able to navigate this traffic that is, the traffic is still on. But thank God you are here. I said thank God you are here. Amen. All right, I'd like to share a few thoughts with us this morning and uh, as a family, let's look at some things from the scriptures. How many of us are, can genuinely say that you are born again? You have received Christ as your Lord and Savior. Let me see your hands up. Wave it at me. Glory to God. That's a good number. Because the scripture says that in uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 11, let's read, let's start our reading from there. 
Genesis chapter 1 from that. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass. They have yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit. What I wanted to notice, they are after its kind. Who see this in itself upon the earth and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind. And the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And, and there are many passages there in the scriptures that refer to the need for things to be after their kind. When we receive Christ into our lives, we receive the life of Christ inside us. We received the life of Christ inside us. It is not something that is going to happen. Eternal life is a reality now. It's what happened to you the day you received Christ into your life. 1 John 5, 11. 1 John 5, 11. This is the record for every one of us that has received Christ into his life. This is the record or God's account that God has given to us eternal life. Somebody say, I have eternal life. <laughs> say it again. <laughs> that is God's quality of life. Eternal life is God's quality, God's kind of life. I showed you that every seed produces after its kind. Every seed produces, if you, if you put tomato on the ground, it will yield tomato fruits. If you put orange seed in the ground, it will bring forth orange. Put purple in the ground, it will bring purple out, purple fruits. You put apple seed in the ground, it will produce apple. So that is what is meant by after his kind. Now look, the Bible says that God has given to us. Say it again, I have eternal life. <laughs> One more time, I have eternal life. And this life is in his son. That is what happened the day you invited Christ into your life. Stop looking at this flesh. This flesh is your license to live here on earth. The day the flesh dies and is tired, your, your true self, which is your spirit, will leave your body. And your spirit does not die, it lives forever. Either it will live forever, for those of us who have received Christ, it will live forever with God. And for those who have refused him and rejected him, they will live forever with the devil. That's why it's important that everyone is born again. It was not a, it's not a suggestion. Jesus said it, you must be born again. It's a must. It's a must. It's something, it's a, it's a decision every human being born on the face of this earth must take to be born again, to receive Christ. As I've said it here, that the greatest thing that can happen to any human being on earth is to receive Christ into his life. Every, any human being. Let me tell you, irrespective of the people we celebrate, all these great people we celebrate outside there, let me tell you, if they don't have Christ in their life, they are dead. They are dead. So the greatest thing is to have eternal life. And then the, now that you have eternal life, the next greatest thing that can happen to you as a believer is to renew your mind. Your mind. That's that your, your soul is the seat of the mind, the will and the emotion. Your chooser. You see it. <laughs> your feeler. That's where you learn. That's where you learn. That's where you feel. That's where you make choices, emotions. Praise God. When you are born again, your spirit is completely safe, ready for heaven. It's, um, your spirit is already made ready for heaven. You are ready for heaven. You are not going to be ready. You are ready if you are born again. Praise God. Now, I've not finished reading the scripture. Go back to that one, John. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his son, next verse. He that had the son had what? Life. You have it. You have life in you. You are not dead. 
And he that had not the son had not life. Whoever does not have Jesus does not have life. They may be going about, but it's a matter of time. They don't have life. If they die, they are going to hell. These things have I written. John speaking to us, he said, I've written this in unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know. That you may know, not assume, you know. It is not a probability. It's not uncertain, you know. If you don't know now, you may never know. Some people say, well, until we get to heaven, no. Don't, you can't risk that. If you don't know now that you have eternal, excuse me, have eternal life, then that's risky. He said, it is written that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Let me hear an amen. amen. Second Corinthians 5, 16 and 17. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Then verse 17. Therefore, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things are passed away, and all things are become new. All right. With that in mind, I've just spoken to us about the the sea. Let's read another scripture. Romans 6.14 For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Now, one of the tragedy of misunderstanding the grace of God upon our life is, is that we, 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 we think because you, God has given you everything by his grace, People can live anyhow they want. No. Every seed produces after its kind. You can't have the seed of the Lord in you. And then your lifestyle is a different story. It's a natural occurrence, natural phenomena that when you plant tomato in the ground, it will produce tomato fruits. It's natural. It's natural. It is natural that when you plant orange in the ground, the seed will naturally produce fruits of orange. It will not produce another thing. In fact, if it does, we will, we will know that something is wrong. Every seed produces after its kind. Now the question is, how do you say that you have Christ inside you and your life is not reflecting it? Your life is not showing it. Matthew 7, 20 says, by their fruits, we shall know them. It is by their fruits. The fruits you produce, we shall know them. How do you say you have Christ in you? You have received Christ. I'm a Christian. I'm born again. And then you are still living the same way. It, 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 it. It brings some question to your, to, your, to, to your claim of being born again. How can you be, David, you can't be born again. And you see, if you truly have the life of Christ in you, and you are hanging around Christ, his mannerism, his behavior, the way he talks, it must surely rub off on you. There is no way it will not rub off. You can't claim you know Christ. You born again. And then when you open your mouth, it is lies that will come out. You easily, you can lie just like that. And you don't bat an eye about it. And you claim you are born again. You claim you are born again. I can't entrust into your hands money. I put money in your hands. I cannot confidently say it is safe and go to bed. And you are born again. How can, how can that be? 
you are born again and the words that proceed from your mouth is nothing but poison. Let's talk as a family this morning. It's poison. People are avoiding you because they don't want to cross your path before you slice them dead. You, you don't kill people only by using, uh, using a knife or a gun. The type of words that proceed from the mouth of somebody who says he's born again, he has Christ in him. The question is, will Christ talk that way? No, you know. How can I be born again? And I leave my house, the way I dress is, is in a way to seduce people. To seduce people. And I, 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 will, I will dress up, I will go to the mirror, I look at myself, and it's okay. Think of it. And you, and you say, you are born again. The Bible says every seed produces, a, it is natural. The things you used to do, you cannot do them again. In fact, you will gravitate towards that. Something has, has changed. There is an exchange, there is a change. You are born again. You can't be trusted. You can't be trusted with the responsibility. Jesus Christ that you say you receive is excellent in everything he did. Check the scriptures. Read the whole book of Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You will see the historical account of Christ. Everything he did was excellent. He excelled in all he did. You are born again. It is what you, what you are specialized in doing is gossip. Gossiping other people. Think of it. What type of born again is that? First Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood and a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show, that you should show, display, put God on display through your life. Put him on display through your life. It is not about what you do in church. I'm talking about your lifestyle anywhere whether in the morning or in the night I was in Abuja preaching on Friday was it yeah on Friday and uh, in the uh, in the conference and the, the, the pastor said gave a te wonderful testimony that I love he said that one of the things that made him I mean he studied in the university and uh, He's a doctor, and uh, so he said well, one of the things that made him take the side to take the path of ministry is that he watched his father. He watched his father, right, because he's 40 years now. This young man is 40 years. He said from day one, he was born till this date, that he watched his father not just talk as a pastor on the pulpit, but live as a pastor. That what he preached is what he lived in the house. He had never seen his father raise a finger against the wife, the mother. The father was seated there, the mother was seated there. I don't want to mention their name because if I mention their name, you will know. They were seated there. And it is true. He said, I never seen him raise his voice. And the father is a gentleman. He said that's one of the things that challenged him to stay in ministry. And so his ministry, I mean, having a very thriving and powerful ministry in Abuja. I just came back last night. Praise the Lord. So the issue is, what type of life do you live outside church pulpit, outside the pews? What type of life? Because what you display will eventually haunt you at the last, at, at, after some time. Some parents are busy now saying that they don't know what's wrong with their children. The issue is what type of life did you live before those children? What type of life? Do you return from the church and roast your pastor before your children? You roast them. You, 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 you begin to 
uh, say all manner, that, manner of bad things you know about church. And you want your children, when they leave this country, to go to church. You are joking. They play. Make it they play. I'm telling you, some of us are suffering receiving the fruits of the seed you sowed. Sad to tell you that. But it's not late to change. What type of Christian are you? Some of you today, it doesn't mean anything to sleep around. Both married and unmarried. We are living under grace. Yeah, we are all under grace. Let's talk. Let's talk and talk to me as family. We are all under grace. And so I thought, I thought you say Christ is living in you. Must anyone police you? Don't you know that anywhere you go, Christ is there with you? He's already there. He said, I will never leave you nor what forsake you. He's there. So you ask yourself the way you talk, the way you respond to people, the way you are aggressive at every little thing. You cut people to pieces when they come, when they cross your path. And so everyone is avoiding you. What type of fruit is that? Put back, put back the faces to show forth the praises of him does your life bring praise to god who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light in time past we were not a people but are now the people of god which had no not obtained mercy but now we have obtained mercy glory to god hebrew 12 40, uh, 14 Look at what he says. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, we, if your life is a mess, if you're a bad specimen of the kingdom of God, they will not see God in display in your life. Actually, that's what that scripture is talking. It's not about going to heaven. Because what sent you to heaven is Jesus. If you have received Christ into your life, you are already heaven ready. So it's not, it's not holiness. Holiness is what will, as a result now of Christ in you, it will produce that lifestyle, uncommon lifestyle. In other words, you are set apart. So the issue is, are you set apart for the Lord? That's the issue. When people, we, we are saying Nigeria is bad, Nigeria is bad, Nigeria is bad, Nigeria is bad. My question is, who made Nigeria bad? Who made Nigeria bad? You have to ask yourself in your little corner, are you behaving as a child of God? I've, I check, I check most of the people who commit atrocities in different as, uh, aspects of the society in the parasitals, in the MDAs, and all the di different companies and, uh, and multinationals, when you check their names, Joseph, Mary, Pastor this, Reverend this. So, why will you not be bad? So what do we learn in church? What do we learn? Are you the type that you say you are, you are involved in business? And what you are doing is going to, the, going to China or the, the Asian countries and buy fake medication and bring here because you must make money. Is that the type of, is that what Christ will do? Killing people. Is that what Christ will do? Every seed produces after its kind. And people are doing it and they are in church bringing offering and tithe. They do it. They, I remember when we were still at the other building. And I was pronouncing, proclaiming courses on people who bring fake medication. I was, the other building. I was saying that anyone who, who brings in, you are coming to the church, and you are bringing in fake medication, there are courses on you. Do you know that some people left the church and said that, what do I mean? That some people left me. It doesn't really bother me, because that's the truth. How can you be killing people simply because you want to make money? Is that the type of life we are supposed to display? 
to show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness. Without people seeing holiness, I say, follow peace with all men, without which no man shall see God, the Lord. The issue is, are you a poor specimen of the kingdom of God? Are you a, pure, a, a poor specimen? Are you the type that you are, miss, you are making people miss the kingdom? In Psalm 1, he says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way. Are you standing in the way of sinners by your lifestyle? Are you standing on their way? You see, are you joining the crowd? You can't beat them, join them. What do you mean? Are you the only one? You can't beat them, join them. Listen, you are different. Put your hand on your chest, say I'm different. Say it, I'm, I'm, I am uncommon. Say it again, I am uncommon. Are you, by your lifestyle, the way you talk, the way you behave, standing in the way of sinners? Are you standing on their way from knowing the Lord? First Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. You all know the account of, account of uh, Paul. Before Paul got converted in chapter, in, 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 in John and Acts of Apostles chapter 9, Paul was a terror to everyone. He was on his way to Damascus to hold Christians and kill some of them and put them in jail when the Lord, when he encountered the Lord. And right there, something changed. Everything about him changed. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. Everything about him changed, turned around, because that's what born again will do. That's what the grace of God that you receive is meant to do in your life. Now let's see what happened to Paul. Paul was not writing to his protege, Timothy. After, after he got saved and was now training him, he said, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who had enabled me for that he counted me. That's what grace does. We are not qualified, but he makes us qualified. He counted me to be faith, faithful. Not just he counted me to be faithful, saving me. He even put me in ministry. He said, look at me. I was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, an injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. I didn't know any better. You see it? And the grace of God of the Lord was exceeding abundantly with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Now, having received Christ as his Lord and Savior, do you know the testimony of Paul everywhere he went? I have defrauded no man. He began to live his life based on the new creature that he was. That he was. Having been born again, he said, look, the person who did those things is no more alive. This is a new man. Can I hear loud amen? amen? So look at this testimony. In second, in second Corinthians chapter seven, one and two. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, is 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 admonishing the Corinthian church. Corinthian church is one of the most promiscuous church, corrupt church, in in in, in the scriptures. Very corrupt. They lived all manner of life. People were taking their father's wives and committing all kinds of atrocity in Corinth. In Corinth. Because he say, he say, he say he, Corinth, Corinth is a, Corinth is a, a, a city that that a lot of a lot of other cities come together. There are different types of people who are involved in Corinth, both Jews, Gentiles, and people from agnostics and people who don't serve God. So all manner of things were going on. As a matter of fact, but this this is just for this is just for the. Of the cough. It's not what I'm sharing. 
this issue of, of women covering their hair is Paul was talking to Corinth. And when he was saying covering head, it's not, it didn't say hair. You see, it's a cultural issue. Even the issue of men wearing hat, covering their, wear, not wearing hat in church. Cultural issue in Corinth. That's where people learned it from. It's not really that if I, if I, if I wear hat in the church, I'm violating God. No. But I, that's, that's a different teaching. You see, the only, the only, the only, the only reason if you, if you say people should wear hat, some of you will wear the one, I won't be able to see the screen any longer. We are the gale, the gale. <laughs> yeah, you won't, you won't see, you won't be able to see your way through. <laughs> we are now told to wear hat. I don't have an issue with people putting on hat, really. But that's a different ball game. You see, all things are lawful, all things are not expedient. It, it, even if it is expedient to do that, it may not be expedient to, I mean, it won't, uh, if it's lawful to do that, it may not be expedient. Why? Because you don't want distractions. I want to sit at the back to be able to see my way through and not your big, big, big heart closing my eyes. I hope, you, you are, I hope we are together. Praise God. I'm saying this to say to you, don't, you, know, you know, the church is becoming a mix so that when you see people in your midst, who put on hat? Don't take ushers and greeters. Don't go and tell them remove your hat. Leave them alone. Because some people from different churches can come and wear their hat because they, they have understanding. Do you understand? Do you understand what I'm saying? Praise God. You know, I've been some, to some places. I put up. I was entering and put on my. Remove your hat. Remove your hat. I, I, well, I removed it because that's their tradition. I don't have any issue with it, but it's okay. So, it's a cultural thing in Corinth. They were committing all kinds of atrocities. So, Paul was writing to them. He said, haven't therefore, you people have received promises of God, God's grace. He said, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, maturing in holiness in the fear of God, perfecting holiness, maturing in being set apart from God, for God. Now, verse 2, receive us. Look at Paul, who killed. Paul, who was a blasphemer. Do you look at this testimony now. Receive us, we have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. When you read that without understanding, you will say Paul is lying. That I read that you killed. I read you committed adultery. But Paul was speaking from his standpoint of a new creature. That now I am a new creature. A change has taken place in my life. I'm not the person that I used to be. So the question is, if you say you are born again, in the compound that you are living, who are you influencing with your lifestyle? Are you the quarrel someone? Are you the quarrel of fighting? The fighter in the house. Fighter. You that is a, a wife. Are you the one that slaps your husband and says, I dare you to talk. And you husband, are you the one that tramp, thinks that your wife is now become a furniture in the house you can trample upon? Because the Bible says you are held together of the grace of God. So I'm talking about lifestyle. Lifestyle of a, of a born again believer. Titus chapter 2 verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation had appeared to all men. That's why it appeared to you and you received Christ. The grace appeared to you. God did not count your mess, your mistakes, your shortcomings, your weaknesses, your inadequacies. He reached out to you and you received him into your heart. Now, he said, the grace as that bringeth salvation appeared to all men. It appeared to you and you received him. That next verse. What does he do? Help me to read the next verse. 12. One, two, go. Hmm. 
Next verse. You see that? Give it to me in New Living Translation. For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. Next verse. That's what grace does. Grace brings salvation. So it brings soteria. So, so. The other was saved from everything the devil has to offer. Next verse. And we are instructed because of that grace to turn from godless living. Godless living. There are, there are places I should not be found. There are wild parties where, where all kinds of orgies are going on that I should not be found there. And you say you're a Christian, you are giggling and enjoying that company. There is an environment a believer should not be in. It's a turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. While we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will be revealed. Give it to me in message translation. God's readiness to give and forgive is now public. Salvation is available to everyone. We are being shown how to turn our backs on godless, indulgent life and how to take on God-filled, God-honoring life. This new life is starting right now. Right now, not when we get to heaven, right now. And it's whetting your appetite for the glorious day when our great God and Savior Jesus Christ appears. Living that lifestyle is whetting your appetite what it will be when we finally see him face to face. Glory to God. I'm tired of Christians, multitudes, filling churches, filling auditoriums, filling stadiums, you ask the person, he says, he said, I'm born again. How do you know you are born again? Because God gave me, he, he, God is meeting my need. That's how the person knows. How do you know you are born again? God gave me a child. How do you know you have eternal life? Ah, I'm a, I'm a born again. No. God gave me a husband. It's only about give, 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 give what he gave to you. And not that you understand that he died for you and as you. He was buried for you and as you. He was raised for you and as you. And that both of you are co-seated with him in heavenly places. Let me tell you, those who don't know Jesus Christ, they, they, some of them have husband without going to church. We have women, prostitutes, who are dropping babies in dustbin all over the place. They have, they give birth to baby. In fact, what, you don't need to touch them. They will deliver. Oh, yes. And yet they are prostitutes. So if the reason why you know you are born again is that God gave you a child or God gave you a house, you build a house or he gave you money, then you don't really understand what born again experience is. You must understand that you are a sinner. You are a sinner going to hell. But God sent his son to rescue you from hell. He died the death you could have died and rescued you from hell that now you have eternal life. Somebody say, I have eternal life. <laughs> glory to God. I said glory to God. Give me that same scripture in TPT, Passion Translation. God's marvelous grace has manifested in person. It has manifested in person. Grace is a person. That's why I have issue with people who, who say, why are you only seeking grace? You are telling me not to teach Christ. Because Christ is grace. Grace is Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody said, Brother Mike, you know, you, you who teach grace, you don't teach truth. I said, no. I said, why do you say so? He said that, he said, he, he quoted for me, John chapter 1. He said that the law was given by Moses and grace and truth. 
He says, so grace and truth, that is grace and there is truth. I said, no, you don't read it well. It is grace which is truth. Grace which is truth. <laughs> so grace, you can't separate truth from grace and you can't separate grace from truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Anyone who tells you that he knows God without that, that only way. Jesus is not a way. Like some of them will tell you that there are many ways to go to God. No, Jesus is not, not one of the ways. He declared boldly, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. John 4, 6, no one come to the Father but by me. No one. No apologies. You can't know the Father except through Jesus. Glory to God. All right. Go back to... So God's marvelous grace has manifested in person, bringing salvation for everyone. For everyone. For everyone. For everyone. This same grace teaches us. The same grace will teach you. Teaches us how to live each day as we turn our backs on the ungodliness and the indulgent lifestyles and it equips us to live like self-controlled upright godly lives in this present age not when you get to have here and now for we continue to wait for the fulfillment of our hope in the dawning splendor of the glory of our great god and savior jesus christ the anointed one can i hear an amen you see God's marvelous love for us is what constrains us to live for him. When you, when you begin to remember and feed on his love for you, it is what, it is what will motivate you to love him more by, by jettisoning some things that you used to do. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. Look at what he says. He says that it, for the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we are all dead. The love of Christ constrains us. It is what, it was, it is what makes us to make a shift. You shift from just anything. It is the love of God that, will, that will, should be your police anywhere you go. You just remember how he died for you in spite of your sins and still loves you irrespective of his love. Thank you, Jesus. I say thank you, Jesus. Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, masterpiece, Masterpiece of artwork created in Christ Jesus. How? Unto good works. Unto good works. You see, you are saved by grace so as to produce good works. When you accept that you are saved by grace, good works will naturally be the outflow from your life. Unto good works which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Give it to me in Passion Translation. We have become his poetry, a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us. For we are joined to Jesus, the Anointed One. Even before we were born, God planned in advance our destiny and the good works we will do to fulfill it. He planned it and all the good works we are all going to do to fulfill that destiny. Give it to me in a New Living Translation. For we are God's masterpiece. I love that. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the reason you are a newborn creature is for you to do the good things he planned for us long ago. The good things he planned for us to do, the way we ought to live. 
The innocent life we are supposed to have been living, which Adam, Adam's fall violated. So it brings us back to live that innocent life. Can I hear a loud amen? A louder amen. Look at um, Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2 from verse 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art, that judges, for wherein thou judges another, thou also condemnest thyself, for thou that judges doest the same things. It's warning us that look, judge yourself. You judge yourself. Stop, stop this accusing figure about other people. Judge yourself. Verse 2. Be, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Next verse. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them, we do the, such things and do the same that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches? Because that's what many of us are doing. Are you despising the riches of goodness of for, and forbearance and long-suffering? Not knowing, without understanding and realizing that the goodness of God is what leads you to a change of mind, repentance. It leads you a change of mind that will affect your lifestyle and not to say it doesn't matter. I'm born again. That's all. No. God's goodness is what will lead you, will, what, what will motivate you. New Living Translation. Give me that New Living tra Translation. In a, Okay. You may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad and you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do these very same things, even though you are in church and clapping hands. You are there speaking in tongues, you are doing the same thing. And we know that God, in his justice, will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? Next verse. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? This patience of God with you. You jump out of church, you jump into mud, then after you jump into one, you jump into church, jump from one mud to the other, and say, I'm born again, it's by grace, leave me alone. He said, does it mean this love of God for you, his patience for you, with you, his long-suffering with you, not dealing with you the way you are behaving. He said, does it mean nothing with to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin. Can't you see that he's kind that the reason he loves you so much with everlasting love, irrevocable, blood bought, ironclad, unconditional love is meant to make you turn from sin? Blessed are your ears hearing what you are hearing. Let me read this in, there's another translation. They have not yet, they don't have it in the app yet. Let me read this in a translation called mirror translation. Therefore, O fellow, from verse 1, the same Romans, therefore, O fellow human, by taking what God did in Christ out of equation, when you take what God did in Christ out of equation, that's God's righteousness. 
there remains no other alternative way for you to defend your innocence. If you fail to accept what God did for you, there is no other way. Your presumed knowledge of what is right or wrong does not qualify you to judge anyone. Especially if you, the self-appointed judge, do exactly the same stuff you criticize others for. You effectively condemn yourself. Verse 2. But in contrast to your judging one another, we have clearly perceived the content of God's righteous judgment. This continuously mirror reflects the truth and remains the constant influence upon those still trapped in an out of your out of sync lifestyle. Because when you are living that dirty lifestyle is an out of sync. It's not in consonance with the new life you have in you. It's not in agreement. Verse 3. Again, fellow human, why do why be so presumptuous in your reasoning, in keeping your performance based system alive in your hypocritical Jew or Gentile? Or oh, I'm for Paul, I'm for Apollos. <clears throat> I belong to this, I belong to that. Judgments of one another. In the process, you are fleeing away from your redeemed innocence. Unveiled in the righteous judgment of God. Do not underestimate, verse 4, God's kindness. That's what many of us are doing. We are underestimating God's kindness. The wealth of his benevolence and his resolute refusal to let go of us. Don't, don't neglect it. Don't take it for granted. Don't underestimate it. Because he doesn't want to let go of us. It's because he continues to hear the echo. The reason God doesn't want to let go of us is because he keeps on hearing in his ears the echo of the likeness, his likeness in us. He keeps on hearing, I love them. I love them. I love them. I can't do them harm. I love them. And its love keeps on pursuing you. It is that love that will make you shift. Thus, his patient passion is to shepherd everyone into a radical mind shift. The reason he's, he loves you so passionately and intimately is to have you make a radical mind shift and say, ah, I can't go this way again. I used to. I, yes, I, I, lo I love cocaine, but now I'm a child of God. I love pornography, but now I'm a child of God. I cannot. I, lo I love to sleep around, but now I cannot. A radical mind shift. I used to steal, but I will not. I will not. Not because it's because you don't want to. Not because anyone is watching you. My last scripture. And we are going to read it in uh, New Living Translation. And then probably also in a, a message. Galatians 5 from verse 16. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil. The evil nature, the old man wants to do evil which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature the results when you follow the sinful nature forgetting that you are born again 
these are the results are very clear sexual immorality impurity lustful pleasures idolatry sorcery some of you worship your 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 your, your, your your, your house, you worship your, 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 your family, you worship your, you worship everything, your money. That's idolatry. Idolatry is not only when you go and bring black, black charcoal and bring, no, no. Anything you put before God is idol. Anything you put before God is idol. For instance, when it time, they say time for offering, and some of you will say, well, uh, 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 whether I give or not, who will know? Your money is your idol. Your money is your idol. Or time for offering. You, you know that God has really blessed you abundantly. You check in your pocket and you bring out five naira and give to God. Who is blessing you? And you know you can afford more than that. Today is pastor's appreciation service. I will talk about that when we take their offering. It's time to take offering. Let's, let's bless our pastors. After all, our pastors, what do you mean? Let me just find 2,000 and give them. If, if 2,000 is shared among the pastors in these headquarters, that means possibly each of them will get 10 kobo. And that's what you can give to them for a year. That's what you give to them for a year. I mean, pastor's appreciation has been, is always constant every year. The day we say thank you to to our pastors for what they have done. I hope you know that me and Big Mommy are not inclusive. It's all these pastors. We also give to them. We, two of myself and Mommy, give our, to because it's not just us that pastor here. They join us in pastoring it. You see that? Idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I've, I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit, the life of Christ, every seed produces after his kind. Produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. I'll give you this for the last time. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, in view of the mercy you have received. You see, God will not make a demand on you of what he has not provided the resources to be able to do. Anywhere you see God's commandment in the New Testament, you will always see that he has made adequate provision. He will not make any demand on us for something that he has not made adequate provision for. Look at that. What people read when they read the scripture is that, I beseech you, present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable. No. He said, by the mercies of God, now that you have received the mercies of God, God not judging you based on your mistakes, now that God is not judging you, bringing you to judgment, because of that, that's the message of God, that you now, your response is, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy 
acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Two, and be not conformed to this world system, but be transformed, changed, by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. What is that saying to you? He said, your life now is a sacrifice. Your life now is a sacrifice. Anywhere you go, you are a sacrifice unto God. You are living as a worship to him. Worship is not only when we sing slow songs. Worship is your life. It's what we do every time. From the moment you wake up, worship begins. Even when you lie down, worship. Even when you are eating, when you are with neighbors, when you are with your wife, your husband, you are worshiping through your lifestyle. In my dressing, I'm worshiping. In my relationship with people, I'm worshiping. In my place of work, I am a living sacrifice. My life will be a display of God's kingdom. A display of his kingdom. Praise the Lord. I say praise the Lord. Let us take a quality decision that we will not be a poor specimen of the kingdom of God. That whoever comes in contact with you can truly say, this one is different. This one is uncommon. It's not, it's not like any other. Let that be your testimony. Let's stand on our feet. Father, we bless your name. Father, we worship you. Just thank God for what you have had this morning. Thank him. I appreciate him. Honor him. Open your mouth and thank him. Thank him. Thank him for what he has done in your life. Thank him for eternal salvation he gave to you. Eternal redemption. Eternal forgiveness. Everlasting righteousness. Thank him for eternal glory that you carry. Open your mouth and thank him. Open your mouth and thank him. Thank him. Thank him. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Come on. He gave me the priceless gift of the Holy Ghost through me. I cannot hear anyone talking. I cannot hear you. He 
gave me the priceless gift of the Holy Ghost through me, through me, God is revealed. I am saved eternally in Christ. And the image, I'm the image of the loving God. He gave me the priceless gift.
we present ourselves as a living sacrifice. Today we present ourselves as a living sacrifice. It's our reasonable worship. That's our natural response for what you have done in our lives. That wherever we find ourselves, our lives will be a testimony of your life that is in us. And we commit that we will not be a poor specimen of the kingdom of God. Holy Spirit, work a work in our lives which only you can do. Let there be a total transformation. In the name of Jesus Christ. May the words we have received this morning not go, not go without expression. Let it find expression in the life of anyone under the sound of my voice. From this day forward, oh God, our life will keep on shining wherever we find ourselves. Thank you, Father. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' name. Everyone shout a loud amen. A believing amen. Put those hands together for the Lord. be seated thank you Lord this is a good time to share communion but uh, before we share communion is there anyone in this building who say brother Mike I want to receive Christ into my life I want to be born again I want to have a relationship with this God. I don't want to assume. I don't want to assume. I want Christ into my life. I want to be reconciled back to God. I know that my life has been a mess, but today I take a quality decision. Beloved, if you reject Christ, you have decided where you want to end up. Hell was never made for the devil. I mean, for any human being. Hell was meant for the devil and his angels. Anyone, any human being who goes to hell made a choice to go. I want to pray for you. I want to pray with you. If you say, Brother Mike, I want Christ in my heart. If that's you. I want you to join me. Let's stand here and pray together. I give you a few minutes. I give you a few minutes. Anyone in the building, wherever you are under the sound of my voice, anyone, Jesus, I want you in my life. I want you in my life. If that's your desire, I want those of you who are seated, look around you and ask the person by you. Have you received Christ in your life? Ask the person, ask the person, ask the person sitting by you. Have you received Christ? Glory to God. All right. If you know you have received Christ into your life, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Shout another hallelujah. hallelujah. One more time, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. All right, prepare your communion. Stand to your feet. Father, I ask your blessing upon these elements, the bread and the wine. 
as we receive, we receive it as your body and your blood. Reminding us that we are healed by your stripes. Reminding us that we are forgiven, eternally forgiven, that we have eternal life. Thank you, Father, for this reality finding expression in every life that is here present. We celebrate you in the name of Jesus. This is the body of the Lord broken for us. It is to assure us that we, we are already healed. Not you will be healed. Somebody shout, I am already healed. I am already healed. No matter the symptom, no matter what it is, the enemy has done. You know what God said is that any tree that the father has not planted, he's going to pull it out himself. No matter what the doctor's report is, no matter whether that condition is healable or not, I declare by the broken body of Christ that you are healed. Yes. From the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, your brain, your ears, your nose, your mouth, your teeth, your throat, your heart, your kidney, your liver, your intestines, your bones and marrow, your, your, your lungs, arteries and veins, every tissue in your body. I declare them today, you are healed. You are healed. You are healed. You are healed. Father, this is your broken body. We receive it now to celebrate our healing. All right, you can eat. The blood that redeems us in him, we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins. We receive his blood to assure us that we are no more under any condemnation. We are, we are reconciled eternally with God. God is no longer, is not putting up with us, enduring us. He believes in our fellowship. He believes in us even more than you believe in yourself. You are eternally forgiven, eternally redeemed. You have eternal salvation. You have eternal glory. You have everlasting righteousness. Can I hear a loud amen? amen? Understanding of this truth will create boldness in you. Because what it means is that heaven is behind you. You are never, you are never alone. A loud amen. This is the blood that assures us of eternal salvation, eternal redemption, and our eternal salvation, and everlasting righteousness. Let us receive it with thanks.
offering. Let us receive our generous giving. Let us receive our tithes, whatever you call it. Let us receive our seed faith. Whatever seed you are sowing, our building offering, building commitments, let's receive them at this time. Those of you who are making transfers, you can make it quickly. Those of you who are giving by cash, you can prepare it. All right. Let's also stand to our feet and it's a privilege, Father, that we can give. We come with our gifts to appreciate what you have done in our lives. We appreciate your loving kindness, your faithfulness. We appreciate your generosity to us. You lavish us with your love, not just with your love, your love is favorably disposed to dispense only good to us. Your love for us is constantly dis, dis, dispensing good on, in our pathway. Father, we are grateful. We bring our gifts to say that we, we appreciate you. We love you with all our hearts. Ladies and gentlemen, there is still a place of sacrifice in the kingdom. Because some of us have forgotten. God can make you make, can, can inspire you to make a sacrifice. God can inspire you and lead you. And when, when you have such leading, never shut it down. Because it's, it's, a, it's, it's a prompting that something powerful is about to come your way. Many times in the scriptures, you will see people who made sacrifices on their own. God just moved them. Some, some people give their all. Like the woman who, who broke the alabaster box of ointment. Like the woman who gave her might. God didn't ask, but she was moved. Always be open anytime there is giving. Because you can be instructed. And don't shut it down when you have such instruction. You can be instructed. Always, I, I feel I should just mention that to us. Very important. But let it come out of a heart of gratitude and a heart of love. Not out of uh, pressure or stress. Out of fear. No. It just prompts you. Prompts you. There is a sister who every, every year comes to me with, with a large chunk of offering. That's her decision. Large chunk. And she, she kept on sharing the testimony that God gives to her. Probably if I see her now, I may not even recognize her. But I know a sister in this house. You see, God can move you. Don't shut down your spirit because of what you read in social media. Don't shut down your spirit. There is a place of giving. It's part of the protocol of believers. There is a place of fasting. There is a place of praising. There is a place of prayers. All these things bring sensitivity to you. Makes your, your, your spiritual antenna alive. To be able to hear God in minutest details. Every one of us is entitled to hear God. But what's happening is that some of us, some of us don't know how to connect with God in, in our prayers, in our fasting, knowing that it's part of fellowship. Praise God. Even up to now, when I want to write my offering, the Lord, the Lord will tell me what to, to write. Up to now, he said, this is what you should give. This is what you should give. This is what you should give. I listen to him. To know exactly what I should do. Praise the Lord. That's why I know I can never be stranded in life. I've never been stranded. I traveled to different parts of the world. Never stranded. Ask Reverend Monday who goes with me in most of the places I go. In his presence, people that I do not know. 
who just ministered to me. Many times we travel, I just stay in the hotel. I don't go anywhere. I just stay there. Fellowshipping with Jesus. Praise the Lord. This life is real. This Christian life is real. It's something we must put on regularly. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We are grateful. We bring our gift because we love you. You are the one who first loved us and we are expressing our own appreciation by bringing our gifts to you. We ask your blessing upon every, every gift we brought. And I ask that you bless every man, every woman, every boy and girl, everyone, oh God, that you have drawn here by your spirit. Thank you that our needs are met, our budget is met. Thank you that we will not be stranded. Your children will not eat from dustbin. Father, I declare over their life that this is the least they will ever give. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' name. Everyone shout amen. amen. Listen, um, you people, that basket you will bring, you can make it better. Eh? You people you can cover it with cloth. You know, decorate it, those baskets. De let it be decorated, different types of uh, yellow, red, white, changing it. Eh? That's excellence. Don't be bringing basket or bowl. I don't want to see bowls in church. Kingdom life is coming. Don't be getting to carry bowl. If carry bowl around here, we'll be in trouble. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> All right.